Hi, I'm Betsy Nicoletti from CodingIntel.com, and I am recording this brief video for the millionth time. Can I get paid for an E&M service on the day of a minor procedure? And as part of doing my annual updates, because, you know, we update all of the content on Coding Intel every year. Sometimes we look at it and not much needs to be done. Oh, gosh, I spelled that wrong or my punctuation's terrible there. And sometimes we need to make some major changes to the content. So let's talk about the global surgical package. And as we go through, I'll tell you why this is more of a change than just a spelling error and terrible punctuation. So we know that the payment for a procedure includes certain preoperative services, the intraoperative services, and certain postoperative care. And this is defined by both Medicare and CPT with some differences. And I'm not going to talk about those today because what I'm going to talk about today is modifier 25. So we, that this is defined as a significant, separately identifiable E&M service by the same physician on the same day of the procedure or other service. When we have this significant separately identifiable E&M service, we append modifier 25 to the minor procedure and we link the diagnoses. And both CPT and Medicare say you can use a different diagnosis or the same diagnosis. So a different diagnosis is easier to get paid, but they both say a different diagnosis is not required. You can use the same diagnosis for the procedure as for the E&M service. Now, if we were together, you would tell me that it's much easier to get paid with a different diagnosis. So from the NCCI manual, the decision to perform a minor surgical procedure is included in the payment and should not be reported separately. And then we get this same verbiage, a separate one, a separate E&M service can be reported. And it's always been subjective. I'm going to talk about that again, about what that significant separately identifiable service looked like. So this is from the Medicare Global Surgery um, MLN Matters booklet. They say that there are zero day procedures. So there's no preoperative and no postoperative, but quote, and this is from Medicare, visit on the day of the procedure is generally not payable as a separate service. And what are these zero day procedures, endoscopies, some minor procedures, some things that aren't minor like cardiac cath? Because a zero day procedure isn't about how significant this is. We're not um, comparing wart removal with a, with a cardiac cath. It's whether the procedure is valued with post-operative care included or not. So a 10-day global period, oh, not endoscopies, but some minor procedures, no preoperative period, the visit on the day of the procedure, according to Medicare, generally not payable. The total global period is 11 days because we count the day of the, the procedure as one and the 10 days immediately afterwards following the surgery. CPT doesn't define major and minor procedures. I mean, they talk about them, they use those words, but the major and minor procedures are defined in the Medicare physician fee schedule and pretty much everybody follows them. The most recent principles of CPT coding, which is old now, had a flow chart with this question. Does this documentation support that the patient's condition required a separate and significant E&M above the usual pre- and post-operative service for the procedure. So this is a slide I've had in this presentation for a while, and um, we're, we're talking about what's included in the payment for the procedure, the decision for the procedure, informed consent, examination of the site, prepping the patient, and instructions for post-op care. But... In March of 2023, the, C the AMA released a um, very helpful book um, about what's included in the payment for a minor procedure. 
And there are, I think, six clinical vignettes. So here they described the typical pre- and post-operative service associated with the procedure in more detail. And they said, these, these things that are in the bullets that we're reading right now are included in the payment for the procedure and can't be reported separately with an E&M service. Review of the patient's relevant past medical history assessment of the problem area to be treated by surgical or other service, formulation and explanation of the clinical diagnosis, review and explanation of the procedure to the patient, family, or caregiver, discussion of alternative treatments or diagnostic options. So I think I'm going to admit there were times when I was auditing an E&M service where if the, with a minor procedure, if the clinician had discussed multiple other options or two or three other clinical options that would have been available, I might have called that, I did call that part of an E&M service. But now here, CPT is specifically telling me discussion of alternative treatments or diagnostic options is part of the work of the minor procedure when you go ahead and do a minor procedure. I'm going to keep reading. Obtaining informed consent, that we always thought. Providing post-operative care instructions, that I think we all agreed that was part of the minor procedure. Discussion of any further treatment and follow-up after the procedure. So again, in before March of 2023, I might have said, now, if, this do, if the clinician had documented, I told them, if this doesn't work, we're going to try A, B, C, and D, or we could try A or B. I probably would have called that part of the E&M service. But now, I, in my assessment, the specificity in this document from March of 2023 makes it more difficult to report an E&M service on the same calendar day when it is for the same problem. When the decision for that procedure is made, and what I see documented is what listed is listed here on this slide, I think it's now harder to bill an e and service. But I encourage you to download that document. Just Google Modifier 25 AMA March 2023. It comes right up. It's not behind the paywall. And I would I would suggest you read the clinical scenarios. So uh, we're never going to get 100% agreement. Some of the most contentious discussions I've been in have been when I say, I do think there should be an e and I don't think there should be an e and And the person with, I'm with whom I'm talking, the coder, the practitioner, disagree with me. But so as I read this definition of the additional specificity in the typical pre and post work, I think it's going to be harder to bill a separate e and but we are still never going to get 100% agreement. So we're going to bill both when we're evaluating the problems and conditions prior to doing the documented. Both are documented, and what is documented is more than the typical pre-work that we saw on the on this slide. So if all of that is in the assessment, is what we see documented, we're not going to bill for both. We're going to bill only the procedure when uh, only the procedure is documented. For a planned procedure, the biopsy or the bronchoscopy was scheduled at a prior visit. For a planned repeat procedure, be very careful about wound debridement. Essentially, when the medical decision-making occurred at a prior visit and for excision or destruction of small lesions. And when all of the documentation describes only the typical pre- and post-work, which we saw three slides back. You're certainly going to be able, be able to bill for both when it addresses a different problem. So the patient comes in with hypertension and on the same day, um, you treat some lesions. The patient presents with a complaint that is evaluated and a 
procedure is selected as the treatment option, but the documentation shows more than typical pre and post work. So here's a pulmonary example. You got a patient in the emergency department with anemia, shortness of breath, coughing up blood, and is seen by the pulmonary physician. There's going to be a very complete um, a history exam and assessment and plan done by that pulmonary specialist. And even if the pulmonary specialist goes on to do the bronchoscopy, if what is described is much more extensive, so uh, we've got this pulmonary specialist going to do a bronchoscopy, but they have reviewed images, they have talked about the patient's COPD, maybe the patient has some kind of nodules, all of that is being assessed uh, by this pulmonary specialist, and then they decide to do the bronchoscopy. I think that's an example of when we would bill for both. Um, <laughs> when the e &M section is completely copied from a prior visit, obviously that's not going to support today's e &M session. So remember, zero global days mean that no post-op care is included after the day of the procedure is included in the payment for the code. So the, there's things that we would all describe as minor, like treatment for a common wart, wart and things that aren't low-risk procedures like endoscopy or cardiac catheterization. So we're going to look at a prior note sometimes when we're auditing e &M services. Is it a new complaint? Is the procedure scheduled at the last visit? Was it? Is it in the global or just outside of another minor procedure? And does the documentation show only the typical pre and post work for today's procedure? And again, we're never gonna get 100% agreement amongst coders, payers, and practitioners. And you know, part of it is that we have different incentives. The payer is looking and thinking, does this really justify paying the clinician for a separate e &M? Our practitioners are looking at it and saying, it was a lot of work before I made the decision to do the procedure. I did a lot of assessment unrelated to the procedure. But one thing I can guarantee you is that we're never going to get complete 100% agreement amongst us. So thank you for joining me. This is one of the Can I Get Paid videos, um, which I've redone here today with this new information. And take a look at Coding Intel, we have a whole list of Can I Get Paid brief videos, and we have a lot of these posted on YouTube as well.